Hello. It's Amanda. So that actually um, is very helpful for setting up my talk in a lot of ways. Um, so my talk is going to be focused on young people and how marijuana policy reforms um, can minimize the harms to you. Um, and so these are the basic, super simplified goals of marijuana policy reform. Um, and we're at a really interesting time right now in that uh, people are recognizing that casual use of marijuana um, is pretty much uh, um, harmless. Um, and we're also, people are at the same time recognizing that the harms of marijuana prohibition, arresting, uh, incarcerating, uh, levying other criminal penalties on people for marijuana possession is uh, very harmful. And so we're at a time now where people are um, feeling less a sense of urgency for this first bullet point, but feeling much more a sense of urgency about the second point and recognizing the, impor the importance of that. Um, so now we're in this era where uh, many states are legalizing, state, or several states are legalizing, many states are decriminalizing, states um, are implementing medical marijuana policies, and overall it seems to have had a very positive impact um, with a um, few known downsides. But there are several concerns about how these changes are playing out. Uh, Amanda mentioned the racial disparities, and we've heard um, about those um, several times this morning. And uh, I want to focus on uh, the harms to youth and how, moving forward, we want to reduce the harms um, to youth, the harms of use, and the, the harms of criminalization of youth possession. And so, um, right. So, uh, teenagers, youth are a very important part of this debate. They're uh, people who are advocating for the continued prohibition of youth, uh, generally like to focus on youth often, um, talking about how if we legalize it for adults, we're sending the wrong message to young people. Um, if we increase access in any way, more marijuana will get into the hands of kids. We'll see increased use of marijuana by, by youth, um, and then of course, all of the scare stories that result from that, increased dropouts, increased driving under the influence of marijuana, um, kids getting brain damage from continued use, um, becoming addicted to harder and harder drugs, things of that matter. Um, and at the same time, people who are uh, advocating for the uh, legal legalization and, and further decriminalization of marijuana um, are also, also talk a lot about protecting youth. And Amanda brought up a really good point about regulating the distribution of drugs towards youth. Um, and in some cases, it's, um, sorry, uh, um, right, so, okay. <laughs> um, and so uh, people are spending a lot of time talking about minimizing the harms associated with drug use for uh, the health and well-being of teenagers, but they're not paying much attention to the harms associated with marijuana. Um, prohibition. And in some cases, that's, that's usually from the people who are advocating for prohibition, but it's also the case in, in some cases for people advocating legalization. For example, in Oregon, they talk, part of that campaign for legalization in Oregon was um, pointing out that the criminal penalties for people under the age of 21 um, are maintained under that legalization scheme. And so the relative importance of these two bullets when it comes to youth is flipped. People are paying more attention to the harms of youth and less important, less attention to the important to the harms of criminalization. And so that's why in the legalization schemes that we've that we've seen going forward, um, the drug is still criminalized for people under 21 in that it's a criminal offense. And so these are the uh, consequences that possession under the, the age of 21 people will still or can still see. And so you can see they're, um, they're, they can be pretty serious, especially in, in Washington state. Um, you can get jail license can be suspended for 90 days to a year. Colorado, um, Colorado actually, they did take steps when they legalized for 21 plus, they did um, reduce penalties for people under 21, um, but it's still considered a criminal offense. Um, and you can get fine mandatory substance abuse education, mandatory community service, um, and then you can see the consequences in Oregon and Alaska. And again, these are still criminal offenses, so they're still on a criminal record. 
Um, and importantly, this is not just <coughs> juveniles, this is people under 21, and so we're talking about adult criminal records for these people as well. And so if the consequences of marijuana possession, um, as you can see here, are more harmful than the use of the drug, which is something that we can debate, um, then it's difficult to see how, how this, how just legalizing for 21 and over is actually protecting young people. And so the question is, how do we best design um, marijuana policies or best reform all marijuana policies so that we're still protecting uh, people of all ages from the harms of criminalization? Um, and so my colleague and I, Mike, Mike Nails and I, um, did this report that we published in September where we looked at um, recent marijuana reforms and compared the impact on arrest rates, um, looking at arrest as, as one of the major harms that come from criminalization. And so we focused on five states, so three states with the most lenient decriminalization schemes in that they're not criminal offenses at all. So that's California, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. And there are a number of other states that have decriminalized to a different extent in that there's no jail time, but there is, um, but they're still considered uh, criminal offenses, or some that have, that are, it's a civil offense for the first offense, but then subsequent offenses for possession are criminal offenses, so we didn't include those. Um, and then legalization for 21 and over, Washington and Colorado. People are familiar with those. Um, and so, so this is what we found, and um, might take a, a second to, to get oriented here, but so we looked at Okay, so we looked at all ages. So these are changes in low-level arrest rates. This is the year before reform and the years after reform. Um, Massachusetts was 2009, California and Connecticut were 2011, and Washington and Colorado were 2012. So they represent different years, but for each of them, it's year before reform and the year after reform. And so you can see, um, so the, the darker the darker bars are the states that have decriminalized it for all ages. The lighter states, so that one and that one, um, Washington and Colorado are the ones that have legalized it for 21 plus. And so you can see that you get the greatest drops in all arrests in Massachusetts and, and California, um, which are the states that decriminalized it for all ages. Of course, it's significant drops for every state, I mean, overwhelming drops in arrests for every state. Um, and so what you can see is that that is led by the drops in arrests for people under the age of 21. And so in the decriminalization states, you have, you have a substantial drop, still substantial drops in these other, in Washington, Colorado, where it's still illegal for people under the age of 21, indicating that there's a de-emphasis by law enforcement on, on uh, enforcing marijuana offenses but it's not nearly as big a drop as what you see here. And so, and yet, and then, as we would expect, when you look at ages 21 and over, the biggest drops are in the legalized states, um, but you still see significant drops in Massachusetts and California. Connecticut's um, a little lower, or significantly lower, and um, we think part of that might be because their legalizations, or their decriminal light, decriminalization is for half an ounce and above, um, whereas all these other states is an ounce and above. And so that might explain it, but we haven't um, looked in detail of that. And so then this is the change in high-level marijuana arrests. And so this one, and so we don't have these data for Washington or Connecticut, um, which is why those bars dropped off. But so you can see that Colorado legalized for 21 and over, um, is where you see the greatest drops here for all ages and for 21 and over, which you would also, um, is, is not a surprise because they're regulating the sales and so you're going to get less people convicted of those higher level um, sales felonies and distribution felonies. But still, under the age of 21, we see a greater drop in California and Massachusetts in those arrests. Um, and so then this is just combining the low-level misdemeanor arrests um, with the felony arrests. Um, and again, we see that Massachusetts and California have the biggest drops in all ages, led by the drops in under 21. And we still have the biggest drops 
for 21 and over in Colorado, the legalization. So, um, if we consider the goals to minimize the harms associated with marijuana misuse for people of all ages and with prohibition for people of all ages, then it's really important to consider to, to distinguish between um, low between minors, children, people under the age of 21, um, and, pe and adults, or to consider people of all ages. Um, and so, so these are some of the, the harms from conviction or from criminal processing of a marijuana offense. And I showed you the harms that are still the case for people under 21 in the states that have legalized marijuana. Um, and it can certainly be much worse in a lot of other states that have not taken that step. Um, and I also want to emphasize the third one, um, and, well, so financial costs, criminal record, and all the collateral consequences. Um, and then I wanted to emphasize the third one, emotional stress, because that is, um, you know, is, is an important consideration. And a lot of people talking about the harms to young people, the harms to teenager of drug use, talk about the vulnerabilities of the teenage brain, the vulnerabilities of the teenage body, and how they're more susceptible to long-lasting consequences of drug use. And the same argument should also be made for the trauma of being arrested, of being criminally prosecuted, of being in jail. And so, so when we're talking about teenage vulnerabilities, I think it's important to, to recognize that they're vulnerable to, to both criminal actions and the drugs themselves. Um, so, um, consequences of marijuana decriminalization. Amanda gave really strong evidence that it is not leading to increases in marijuana use. And this is for, for youth, by the way. And so, so Amanda described that first one. Um, there's also no evidence causally linking it to the use, subsequent abuse of other drugs. I'm sorry I don't have references here, but if, if you're interested, you can certainly email me and I can send you those refer references. And there's no evidence that occasional marijuana use has long-lasting detrimental cognitive or health effects. Um, and this is something that's definitely controversial. There's, there, there are a lot of, um, a, a, fair, a fair amount of studies that, that claim to show um, adverse consequences, um, but these are often decontextualized. They're, they're people with, who, who have very heavy long-term use of marijuana, which is thought to be uh, destructive for people of all ages. Um, and so there's really nothing conclusive coming out of that. There's still research going on. Um, but uh, overall, it's, it's a little tricky for people um, who, are, who are arguing these because we're kind of forced to, to prove a negative, right, to, to argue for the absence of evidence. And so it's a tricky, it's a difficult position to be in. Um, but, you know, the, but right now this is, this is the case that there's no evidence that that there is this long-lasting uh, uh, impact. And meanwhile, we all know of uh, plenty of legal things that, that children are allowed to do that for which there is more evidence of harm. Um, they're allowed to smoke tobacco when, when they're 18. They can drink alcohol in the privacy of their home at any age. Um, they can drive a motorcycle when they're 16. They can uh, play tackle football you know, as when they're eight. And so there are plenty of things that are that are more closely associated with cognitive, having cognitive impacts. Um, okay. And so this is also from the study that Mike Mills and I have published in September. Um, and so this is looking specifically at California, ages 15 to 19, um, the impact um, oops, before, um, before reform and then two years after reform comparing with the rest of the United States, so the U.S. minus California. And so you can see, and these are various um, scary uh, <laughs> consequences that people think can result from drug use uh, by teenagers. And uh, you already saw the, the crime data from Amanda. We also saw a decrease in driving under the influence of marijuana relative to the rest of the United States. Um, decrease in school dropouts. We don't have those data for the rest of the United States. Um, oh, I'm sorry, for suicides, that should be a plus. So suicides went up in California, but they went up slightly more in the U.S. Um, 
So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, whoever took a picture of that slide, <laughs> make sure you note that. Um, and then drug overdoses, we also did not see an increase in that. So, um, and then the racial data. So we've um, heard a lot about this. This is certainly uh, not an encouraging slide, not an encouraging finding at all. So, um, so unfortunately, most uh, or many of the uh, jurisdictions in California did not distinguish between Latino and white until relatively recently. Some of them are still, like San Francisco, still has problems with that. And so the best we can do as far as looking at racial disparities is do black versus all other ethnicities. And so it's really um, unfortunate that we may never, probably will never have those data for these earlier years because of the way police departments were scoring uh, race. So often people who were Latino were considered either other or white um, or, yeah. So, so, it's, so this is the best we can do at this point. And, I'm sorry? Um, and so as you can see, there. Uh, so this is uh, misdemeanor arrest rates for people under the age of 21 um, per 100,000 residents. And so you can see that it's, it's actually about the same before and after decriminalization. Decriminalization was effective January 1st, 2011. Um, and one of the really striking things about this is you can see that before decriminalization, all other races and ethnicities were arrested at about the same rate as African Americans after decriminalization. And so that's um, pretty, pretty disturbing. Um, okay. And so, conclusions. So, state that decriminalized marijuana possession for all ages saw significantly greater drops in youth arrests and states that only legalize marijuana possession for 21 and over. Um, states that legalized it for 21 and over saw more significant drops in arrests for adults, especially for more serious offenses. And um, marijuana decriminalization in California has not resulted in harmful consequences. And of course, the staggering racial disparities are unchanged. Um, and so, for our recommendations, um, we think it's important to reduce unnecessary exposure to arrest into the criminal justice system for people of all ages. And so I think Amanda made a really great case for creating a legal regulated market for adults. Um, and that's certainly something that, that we recommend. Um, and we think it's important to include decriminalization of the drug for people under whatever that age is, is determined to be. Um, and then focus on focus efforts on treatment-based approaches to reducing problematic misuse. There's certainly marijuana is not completely harmless. There are adverse consequences of dependency, of uh, long-term uh, heavy use. And then um, reforming police procedures and practices to reduce racial disparities. And so that uh, there's a number of things that could happen there. I mean, uh, it includes reducing stop and frisk, reducing racial profiling. Uh, changing the way that police um, uh, go about looking for uh, drug deals instead of just targeting open air drug markets, um, looking at, at more problematic or, or other problematic um, drug markets and, and areas of, of drug misuse. And of course, that um, you know that that's still only the beginning. I I completely agree with the earlier speaker about. Um, looking at reparations for the harms that have already been done to these communities, um, you know, the people who have spent time in jail and prison for crimes that we now do not consider crimes. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be got, be done, um, and additionally, looking at legalization um, regulation and uh, making sure that there are ways that that increases opportunities for communities of color, that it provides jobs for communities of color. I know in um, Colorado and Washington, I believe, um, it is, if you, have a, if you have a criminal record, you cannot own a, a, a marijuana dispensary or a pot shop. So you, there's already prohibitions that are 
going to be disproportionately impacting um, people of color in the, in those states. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. And in California, we know that most of the growers are white. Uh, many of them come from out of state. So there's a we want to be wary of that sort of gentrification of, of the uh, marijuana market. Um, that's it. And I'm sorry, I don't have my email address, but my name is Liz Buchan, and my email address is lizzie at cjcj.org if you have any questions about that.